What's up, Rocket? What's going on? How's everybody? Ra ra. <laughs> Smitty Bob. <laughs> Can all you guys still play? No. <laughs> no. No. I still play in these over 40 leagues down here in Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to another episode of Like We Never Left, the show where SNY brings athletes and teams back together again. Today, we are reuniting UConn legends who helped build a foundation of a program which became a powerhouse. I'm talking to the members of the 1990 Men's Big East Basketball Champs. I'll let them introduce themselves first. We're going to start with you, Rod. Hello, I'm uh, Rod Sellers, uh, 88 through 92 UConn years. Uh, from South Carolina originally, went up to Connecticut and had an outstanding time. I made some great friends for life and we did something special up there at UConn, so I'm very proud of that. So I hold UConn very dear to my heart. Chris Smith, Bridgeport, Connecticut, 88 to 92 with Rod Sellers as well. Uh, went to UConn, it's a home school. Uh, like like Rod said, I believe blue as well. Uh, best decision I ever made. Uh, got some of the best friends you can ever have uh, coming out of UConn. So, so happy that I made that choice. All right. And now my favorite UConn Husky. Well, at least men's is, is, is involved. You know, I like Diana Taurasi. She's my favorite Husky. But anyway, on the men's side, hey, Scott Burrell, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, I don't know if I believe what you said, number one, but <laughs> Scott Perrell, member of the UConn Huskies, 89 to 93, um, followed Chris Smith. Um, they try to keep the best players in the state at home, and uh, I followed Smitty because I believed in what he was building and helping and help what, what UConn be has become today. And look who joined in, the guy himself, Coach Calhoun. Thanks for joining us, Coach. <laughs> My pleasure. My, I'm just liking hearing the stories. Coach, when you look at these three guys, when you think back to that 1990 season, it's called the dream season. Did you know going into it that you had something special? Scott probably hasn't said this, but he got hurt, really. You know, we played three or four games, go up to uh, the Great Alaskan Shootout and played. And then all of a sudden, Scott, he was up, what, three or four weeks, Scott? Mm -hmm. yeah. Three weeks, yep. Yeah. yeah, and and I remember it's till this day. You know, where is he? But uh, I tell you what happened during that time. So we didn't quite get all our pieces. We started 0-2 in the league. Yet I was intrigued because, you know, we uh, – we turned people over 20, 25 times. Mm -hmm. A couple of games we lost early. And there was a yeah. sign there. If we could put this together, we're going to have something. Scotty being out was devastating to all of us, except for the fact other guys, Murray Williams, Lyman mm -hmm. DeBreeze, et cetera, get a chance to play. Trina Walker. They get a chance to play. And all of a sudden, we're not like a 6 7 team. We're like a 9 10 team of a lot of guys that could really, really play. Well, Rod, what was your favorite memory from that year? The way that we played and how hard we played and, you know, just pressing like 40 minutes nonstop. And we built this camaraderie, that team there, that 89, 90 team built the camaraderie where we were like a family, like brothers, like blood brothers, all of us. Yeah. It was just so many of us, but like one, like we were just one family and we had fun. We had fun doing it. Coach could really just go to the bench if he, if he saw that we weren't scoring, if we weren't playing well. Well, guess what? We had guys on the bench that could come in and play hard. And, uh, you know, the competitors and all of us, we never wanted to go to the bench. Here's <laughs> Scotty. Scotty, you know, Scotty, you know, I scored 24 <laughs> one game. Scotty scored 22. You know, he wanted 28. And, I mean, we were just going at it like that. And and I'm like, who is this rookie coming in scoring all these points, you know? <laughs> but uh, – and, and that's how we played. We just had that hunger. We really wanted to win and we wanted the team to win. Every day in practice, coach got the most out of us. It was like a dog fight in practice every day. Yeah. It was so competitive. It was so competitive. The games were much easier. And I love yep. seeing teams' faces. Our press was so good. To see yeah. teams' faces that were demoralized, defeated, yep. they didn't want the ball in their hands because they knew they were getting trapped and getting stolen. You see it early. Yeah, yeah, that was the most fun yep. we, I had. Being on defense, everybody, everybody being on the same page and demoralizing a team. Like we, we practice was so hard sometimes we would never get tired and in games. We definitely get tired because we went so hard in practice. I can't believe Scott's talking about practice. <laughs> <laughs> Come on guys. This is going to be a night of truth. I want to tell you something about this group. These guys believe not necessarily in themselves, but in us. And I think yeah. that's the thing that I was always so happy with that team. Every time I go someplace and these guys show up again, 
it's back to 89.90 in, in that incredible, incredible run. Well, it's yeah. funny because Donnie Marshall just joined. Donnie, you weren't part of that team, but why did you come to UConn? Well, it probably was the first fight when I went to uh, watch it. Ross, that was actually a part of it. My first practice. <laughs> I, I, listen, I'm a, I'm a soft West Coast kid now from the Seattle area. And I get, I'm on my recruiting trip and I'm sitting next to Kevin Ollie and all of a sudden a fight breaks out in the middle of the floor. Rod Sellers was involved, sorry, Rod. But it, <laughs> it, it, Rod was involved and there was another big dude, to get, get, the biggest guys I've ever seen in person, Mark Sir. I mean, he oh, was yeah. seven one, oh, yeah. seven two, uh, and, and Rod's hands were uh, as the biggest hands I've ever seen, long arms. <laughs> and the thing that really, I know this sounds crazy. I know I'm a little sick. It, 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 you guys don't have to agree. We are. We already know. It turned me on because Coach Calhoun let them go at it, middle of the yeah. floor, <laughs> and it was almost like hockey. It was like if someone hits the floor, then we stop it. But as long as these guys are upright and and they're going and there's you know obviously we don't want teeth to come out and, and Rod's pretty face, so we don't want to mess yeah. that up. But I think just the, the, the idea that the, the toughness of Big East and, the, you know, if there was a chance to play at that next level, uh, this was the place, this is where it would start, in the Big East yeah. at UConn. This is not, it, listen, it's not just about punching guys. and be, What happens is when you get in those fights, now you become closer. And I think, obviously, yeah. Calhoun, Coach Calhoun knew that, and he only let it go so far. And then you're yeah. going to eat with those guys afterwards and, and now when you get in the game, they have your back because you know yeah. that it's all about fighting for one another. But as soon as I saw that first fight, I'm like, oh, <laughs> yeah. And then we had a young kid by the name of Danielle Marshall that came in one of his shots as well. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was just going to say, let's introduce in someone else. You didn't play on that 90 team, but Daniel, why did you decide to come to UConn? I think for me, it was, uh, it was a tough choice. Um, you have to remember when I came on my recruiting visit. Um, I took the SATs, so I really couldn't go out. Scott and them, Scott was my host, really couldn't take me out for a good time. You know, I would honestly say the out of my three visits, UConn was my worst visit of the three, um, as well as they lost the Marathon Oil the night before. <laughs> <laughs> they had a five-hour practice. That was before the 20-hour the, the 20, the 20 rule. They had a five-hour practice. Dancer Rulick is over at the trash can throwing up. <laughs> like, I am not – I'm not coming here. I, I'm not practicing five hours after a loss, you know, this and that. And, um, you know, but for me, <clears throat> the reason I went there was even though I was an All-American, I didn't want to be the man right away. Um, you know, I had a lot of other schools who wanted me to come in and, you know, Loyola's talking about, uh, you know, where else can you go and shoot 25 times a game as a freshman? <laughs> I told the coach straight out, if I can shoot 25 times a game as a freshman, we're not that good, you know. And, you know, <clears throat> I wanted to come somewhere where, you know, I knew I had a plan set out for me. And my plan was, you know, Chris Smith was going to be the leader uh, my freshman year. Um, Scott Burrell was going to be the leader my sophomore year. And by my junior year, it was going to be time for me to take over. I got to ask about the shot. That's all when I, from people first, when I first told people when I was I'm married to Scott Brell, when I'm in Connecticut, all the time, the shot. What do you guys remember from that game? I remember blowing a, a huge lead. Uh, <laughs> I remember yeah. dominating a game for 35 minutes. Yeah. And I don't know if boredom came and took over or we fell asleep a little bit, but they got hot and made some making some shots. Then I remember Smitty forgot to guard the guy in the corner. <laughs> and they hit a three. But I knew there was a couple, I knew there was one second left. So we had the ball back with one second left. <laughs> and I knew we had a chance to, to still win. And yeah. you know what? Tate did a great job of walling this guy off. Um, he did. Smitty was a half court. Yep. But I knew if I got to Smitty half court, it's still gonna be a half court shot. Yep. Um, I just want to get down as far as I can. And Tate did a great job of walling off his guy and gave me at the left hand. and. You know, I was able to throw it to the left hand right hand corner for tape to turn up, make a turnaround jump shot. And uh, it was an unbelievable feeling from going down in defeat to coming up and uh, being victorious in one second. It was unbelievable. Unbelievable feeling. 
and, and I tell everybody the ball was supposed to go to me. <laughs> I know, but I don't want to say that. Did he? <laughs> yeah, you should have still threw it to me at half court. I'd made that shit. <laughs> Mini, but you it always, yeah. the ball was always supposed to go to you. Yeah, yeah, always. I, I told you. Hey, Danielle. Thank you, Danielle. That was perfect. <laughs> Coach, I, mean, I, I remember know. coming in as a freshman having a really good game, and you talking about, yo, young boy, you took enough shots right now. It's time to <laughs> but all, but the ball was always supposed to go to you. <laughs> oh, God. This is where I think I have to interject because my situation was a little bit more unique. You know, coming from Seattle, the, the first time, and honestly, this, this is the power of Connecticut basketball even back then, the first time I'd ever seen Connecticut play was actually, and I can't remember who the commentator was, but he basically gave Scott's bio as he was inbounding the ball, basically <laughs> saying first round draft pick for the Seattle Mariners. And, and for a Seattle kid, that's all I had to hear. Now that was exactly wow. when I tuned into that game. The first wow. time I'd ever seen Connecticut play wow. was because there was a guy who played for my baseball team as wow. a kid who was throwing this ball inbounds and then when the shot went down and i can't remember it was it was later i think at night for us because i remember yelling and screaming and, and my mom ran out of the other room thinking something <laughs> happened to me but that and actually something did happen to me i mean it, seeing that play and then you fast forward a few months and now all of a sudden this school is recruiting you yeah. It, it, for me, it was it was so powerful. To, I just I felt connected, even though none of these guys, none of these guys knew they'd someday be my big brothers and my brother Danielle and and a, and like a father to me, Coach Calhoun, because of that one player, because that guy said, "Listen, Seattle Mariners pitcher Scott Burrell," and and then the rest was history. This was a group of guys that came together and honestly came on on faith, because we hadn't done an awful lot nationally, being one of the best teams in the country and a chance to win the whole thing. And it, it, it was a dream season that set up all the great things that happened after that. How much do you guys hate Christian Leitner? Well, he's easy to hate without the shot, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> I played with Christian for two years in Minnesota. Okay. And we talked about the game. He, number one, he'll probably never tell you this now, coach, but he felt like we, from man to man, we had a better team. He told me that. He said he thought we were going to win that game he thought we were a better team and uh, had more talent than that than, than they had. I want to hear your favorite coach story. John Gwynn and I used to stretch all the time. So we were in the NCAA tournament. And co every time we played an NCAA tournament, coach used to come to us and say, man, I want to win this game. I'm pissing vinegar. I'm pissing vinegar. I want this game so bad. <laughs> right? So John really believed Coach was pissing vinegar. I was like, John, he's not. He's not. That's just an expression of speech, man. He wants to win this game. So I'm going to tell you a funny story. I started coaching high school, right? And that was one of my favorite sayings. We got to the tournament, and I, the coach was, the, the guys were stretching. And I tell the guys, man, I want to win this game so bad, I'm pissing vinegar. You know? That was my thing. Why did I get the call from the principal the next morning? <laughs> you can't tell the guys, you're pissing vinegar, Smitty, you know? So that was one of my favorite stories, but that, that's what I took from Coach. <laughs> Rod, what about you? Now, one of my favorite Coach stories is, I, I think we were playing Boston College. I'm not exactly sure, but Dana Barrels was killing us. And Coach came in the locker room at halftime, and he's so pissed that he kicks the chalkboard, boom! But his foot gets stuck. He's still screaming as his foot is stuck. And Coach D is holding him up. And he's still screaming at us. And I'm trying to look at the line there, at the players, because he's going to kill me if I laugh. He's still screaming as his foot is stuck in the chalkboard. So that, I, I, I love that story. That was awesome. But we went out second half, and of course we responded and we won. So yeah. <laughs> I was say it worked, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> Scott, what about you? I think my my, my favorite story is we got Villanova, and I don't know if it's halftime or it was, it was, the game was over, and teams used to leave food in the locker room for us, and we got beat by Villanova. So <laughs> we had food and drinks on the table, 
And we said, we got to move the stuff or coach comes in. We got to move the stuff. <laughs> we left one soda out there. We left one soda and he oh, found man. it. He kicked it all over our suit. <laughs> like, damn, it was all sticky and wet. So it was, he, found, he found the one soda that was out there. <laughs> Coach, you just heard these five guys who obviously have so much admiration for you and just and what you built with these five guys. What does it mean to you? But I think it's collective. It's, it's watching them come together and watching sometimes, you know, someone said, why do you push them so hard? So I said, because they'll have something common to hate. And that's me. And again, they all can tell you within that gym, many days they left there and they came together to say, all the things they said about me in the locker room. <laughs> and I truly believe that, by the way. I truly believe that they came together with a common cause. And at first was, why is this crazy guy pushing and yelling and screaming? Then I realized they got by that and understand they did it to themselves. And I could see Smitty barking at the guy and I could see Donnie helping the teammate and Scotty, et cetera, and Rod. I'm not seeing the guys doing the same kind of things because they cared about each other. You know, and then me, like I never played with Karan. You know, they didn't play with Rip, didn't play with those guys. But it was funny because when we would stretch and stuff, you know, one of us would just yell out UConn. And the other person already knew that, yeah. you know, who they were speaking to. And I remember the trainer one time saying like, he was like, yo, every time we had a UConn guy, they always said that to the other player. And you already knew who he was talking to. And my response was, because we know if we don't speak back and it gets back to coach, we in trouble. <laughs> like, it doesn't matter if we played with him or if we didn't play. Like, he yeah. installed family into us that we're all brothers, that yeah. we we have to speak to each other. That's the yeah. way we are. All right, guys. Well, thank you to all of you for getting back together on Like We Never Left. I am sure so many <laughs> UConn fans are so thankful for you guys and this reunion. And thank you for setting the foundation for all the UConn teams to follow. Appreciate you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for you. having us. Thank you. Do I get a Thank go UConn? Go UConn. Go UConn. That's right. Oh, <laughs> <laughs>